which they've been assigned thereafter. So male and female is the, one of the primary gender binaries, and they're considered mutually exclusive. And real men and real women are hard cultural stereotypes to live up to, of course. Um, so with that in mind, we told a little bit of history. So as we heard a little bit already, in the 19th century, you see the, the, the gradual um, rise of secular power and the decline of religious authority. And with that change, that cultural change, what used to be referred to as sins begin to come up, instead of being under the province of religion, uh, become subject of discussion for medicine and science. And so, as, as I say, ecclesiastical authority wanes with the rise of the modern state, religious abhorrence of homosexual practices continues in secular law. But science and medicine reject traditional moral categories of right and wrong as explanations of deviance, supposedly. And science searches for the causes of deviance and forces beyond the control of the individual. It's not that you're you have sinful motivations as you have an illness that compels you. We recognize this model, for example, in AA. You know, you're not a bad person because you drink too much. You know, you have a disease called alcoholism, and that's you know, a way to try and remove the moral censure associated with the condition as a way to reduce shame to help people try and deal with the issue of how they control their drinking. And many sins uh, would eventually come to be classified as illnesses. So, uh, for example, demonic possession came to be known as insanity and drunkenness became alcoholism and sodomy became the sin of homosexuality. So, uh, Ulrich's, the third sex theory, by the way, was a, a theory of normal variation offered you know, in the middle of the 20th century. Kraft, Von Kraft, that thing we heard about, uh, he wrote a very important book. In some ways, the psychopathy of sexualis is a predecessor to the DSM and diagnostic manuals because Anything that scientists and psychiatrists and doctors listed at the time automatically became a condition because they were the experts. There was a lot of, uh, we also had a patriarchal medical system. So, uh, the psycho and many of the um, conditions that he wrote about, uh, and he would expand the psychopathy essentially, they talk about the expansion of the DSM diagnoses with every value, there's expansion in psychopathy sexualis because people would send him case histories that he would include. And subsequent editions, and many of the things he wrote were in Latin, so that he, so that the layperson would not be able to read the racy parts, mm -hmm. just doctors and priests. So um, Kraft Ebbing, however, worked from a 19th century theory of pathology called degeneracy theory. This was a neurology theory that assumed that many of the conditions uh, which were caused by degeneracy were the result of a decadent lifestyle that it was a problem with too much civilization. Uh, this was, of course, a time before neurologists had even known, known, knew that synapses exist between nerve cells. And it's not a theory that has any credibility today, but it was a major factor in, um, in thinking about homosexuality as a, dis as a disease. Even, and you know, even though today we think you know, that uh, we use the argument that people are born gay as a way to say that they're not ill, but in, in, in Kraft Ebbing's Manual, if you were born with a homosexual predisposition, if you, it wasn't a, a good, a morally neutral thing. It meant that you had a congenital disease. So you can tell these stories from many different perspectives. Having a gay gene doesn't mean that people are normal. It depends on how you tell the story. But uh, Kraft Ebbing's major contribution in this area was he was influential in disseminating among medical and scientific communities the term homosexual, as well as the view of homosexuality as a psychiatric disorder. Talk a little about psychoanalysts. Uh, we heard a little bit about Freud. Freud took issue with both uh, third sex theory and with uh, the pathology. Um, in the aforementioned three essays on the theory of evolution, he, he, he was in the inversion camp. That was his favorite term at this point in his career. Um, contrary sexual feelings was another term for homosexuality. He, he argues with, basically, with Kraft uh, Ebbing's degeneracy theory, saying that uh, it, homosexuality could not be caused by uh, degeneracy because it was found in people with the highest moral development. It was found in ancient Greece at the height of a civilization, and in Rome, and was also found in primitive cultures, none of which qualified for degeneracy theories. And, but he also did not think that homosexuality 
was, in, was entirely normal. And he kind of takes a, in a footnote that he had a few years, well, 10 years later, after Magnus Hirschfeld left the uh, psychoanalytic movement, he takes a swipe at third sex, third sex theory, saying that uh, he's opposed to separating off homosexuals from the rest of mankind as a group of special character. I, I've often read articles where people cite this show enough open-minded for it was, because you know, gay people should not be separated off from everybody else. But he's writing a different historical time about a different subject, and what he's really doing is he's attacking the third sex theories of Magnus Hirschfeld, which in the later day he attacks more forcefully and less obscurely. So Freud comes up with a third version, which is neither illness nor um, nor normal, and he calls it a developmental arrest. Not quite an illness, but not quite normal. So in Freud's theory, everybody is born with bisexual, everybody is born with bisexual feelings, and that it's normal and when you're young to have uh, expressions of those feelings. But when you grow up and you become an adult, the homosexual side must be sublimated because he felt it was part of how we form friendships and non-sexual same-sex relationships but it should not be openly expressed. Uh, but if you did, it wasn't your fault because it was a developmental arrest. Um, and of course, calling somebody childish may not be as offensive as calling somebody sick, but I don't think either one is particularly respectful. Um, and there are other psychological theories that also pick up on this uh, developmental arrest idea. Uh, Freud's last known words on the subject uh, were published I think in the early 60s, a letter was found by someone at the Kinsey Institute uh, that Freud had written to a woman, which is now referred to as a letter to an American mother, who, was, uh, who wrote to Freud, presumably her letter does not survive, asking him to cure her son of homosexuality. And he wrote in this long letter, you know, like, uh, one he started by saying, how come you don't use the word in the letter? We heard why people don't talk about it. And he wrote that homosexuality is assuredly no advantage, but it's nothing to be ashamed of, no vice, no degradation. It cannot be classified as an illness. We consider it to be a variation of the sexual function produced by a certain rest of sexual development. And so this was pretty much his theory at the time. But the psychoanalysts who came after Freud uh, were not so um, um, embracing of this theory. They redefined homosexuality as a perversion. Perversion in its original scientific sense simply meant a turning away from, meaning a turning away from the, the, uh, the expected sexual object, which was supposed to be a heterosexual partner or an adult of the other sex. So all the perversions, which we, you know, the scientific term per, 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 perversion became pervert in, in general language, pretty much like degeneracy theories. Degenerate became a, a, a term that people use. It originally started as a scientific Term because science cannot hide the disdain sometimes that the culture feels for something and these words enter the language. The most important person uh, in the uh, redefining homosexuality as an illness was a Hungarian uh, named Shanda Rado who came to the States in the 30s uh, and eventually founded the Columbia Psychoanalytic Institute. And he argued that homosexuality represents avoided anxiety of the other sex. And his work was very highly influential in American psychiatry when it was dominated by psychoanalysis. And among the people who wrote about this work, we heard about the Bieber study, which Barbara Kiddings talked about in the speech we heard. Irving Bieber and a group of colleagues put together a case study of 106 homosexual men compared with 100 heterosexual men and concluded, one, that they had cured 27% of their gay male patients of their homosexuality and that in most cases the homosexuality was caused by a, a, a domineering mother uh, or a, with, with a combination of either a withdrawn or, or, a, or an absent father. Um, in the 1970s, Clarence Tripp, a gay psychologist who wrote a very interesting book, uh, challenged Bieber to produce a, you know, one of his cured cases as proof. You didn't have to produce a patient, you just had to write a paper or a book. And, uh, and Bieber, rather than producing a patient, filed an ethics complaint against the trip to the American Psychological Association, which did not go anywhere. But that's, you know, that's pretty much the case uh, in terms of, uh, I don't know if you look through, there was a lawsuit against conversion therapists in New Jersey that recently found the uh, Jonah, 
organization which provided conversion therapy is guilty of fraud, and part of the process within the uh, system was they were not able to produce any uh, clients, because they weren't really doctors, they weren't able to produce any clients who have actually been changed as, you know, in their defense, so that was one of the reasons they lost the suit. Similarly, you had uh, one of the most, um, uh, and Sakura Chow, Sakura who wrote many books, his first book uh, on homosexuality, is he claimed uh, that unlike Freud, who didn't believe that homosexuality was a neurosis, which meant there would be an illness, that it wasn't a neurotic condition. And in his 1995 book, claimed that he had cured 35% of the people um, who came to see him over the course of his professional life up to that time. I, it's a very funny book, actually. It was self-published. It was a, it was a called Homosexuality or Freedom Too Far. And he, uh, he's, and he, he questions and answers himself in the book. So he asks himself, well, if you guys are so good, how can we only cure 35%? And he said, you know, well, another one-third, he said, were moved away. <laughs> and I thought, That's not what, well, that must have been what they had to tell him to get out of his office. <laughs> And another, and another third were so entrenched in the homosexual lifestyle that they could not change. So, uh, Sakharidi's son, uh, Richard, you may see on television, came out as a gay lawyer in the 1990s and was President Clinton's uh, liaison to the LGBT community. <laughs> and um, and uh, Charlie, Charles, Charles died on September on Christmas Day, 2005, three days after the APA sent out ballots for the president, and I was on the ballot as a non-candidate for president of life at the American Psychiatric Association, but there's no truth to the rumor that seeing my name on the ballot killed it. <laughs> so psychoanalysis uh, uh, was, and psychiatry were almost uh, synonymous in the middle of the 20th century, um, and at the time, there were some homophile organizations uh, within the managing society itself who did accept the illness model as an alternative to societal condemnations of immorality, and they would work with the doctors who sought to treat and cure homosexuality. At the time, doctors would say, you know, homosexuality should not be criminalized because it's an illness, and therefore, you know, we should, we should treat these people with compassion. But other activists, and I think Frank Hammond and Barbara Giddings, and most notably among them, uh, rejected the illness model as a major contributor to anti-homosexual stigma. And they were, they were the ones who prevailed, and they were the ones who affected change. They were helped in part by sex researchers, sexologists. Um, in modern sex research, we heard a little bit about Magnus Hirschfeld and, sex re and uh, Havelock Ellis, who were sex researchers of the late 19th and early 20th century. But in modern sex research, you have a uh, view of homosexuality emerges as a normal variant of human sexuality. And like left-handedness, just because only a minority of people are gay or left-handed doesn't mean that it's not normal. Although many of you who were older in the group will remember when children who were left-handed were forcibly converted to right-handedness. Um, and most influential, I'll talk a little bit more in detail with Kinsey reports and, and Edmund Hooper uh, report. Now, um, I'll start by saying that the psychoanalytic and psychiatric research of the time was most about homosexuality was mostly based on studies of people who were unhappy who had come to see psychiatrists about their unhappiness for whatever reason, and, on, and also on studies of prison populations. So what modern sex researchers did is what we refer to as field studies. That is, rather than looking at the skewed sample of homosexual individuals, they went out into the general population and tried to find broader views you know, of, the, of the subject under study. And Kinsey, if you haven't seen the movie, I highly, I highly recommend it. It's a great movie uh, about his life. He started out as an insect taxonomist who studied differences between wasps, and he would see like you know, gradual evolutionary differences across a field where different wasps live. And he had the notion that, um, that there were gradations in all expressions of behavior, you know, and that in human sexuality, as he used to say, mankind cannot be divided into sheep and goats, nothing is black and white, and so he was very interested in the ways in which variation uh, promoted uh, evolution and the value of, uh, of um, the 
variation within species. So his group studied thousands of people they did interviews and asked them directly about their sexual practices. And these were not people who were psychiatric patients. And he came up with the famous Kinsey scale, which you saw a version of, like another one here. And he um, came up that there were high rates of homosexuality anywhere from 10 to 37 percent within adult people that's, that 10 to 37 percent of people studied it had some adult homosexual relationship within their lives and which led him to conclude it can be an illness and it's this common in this diffuse. Now, uh, it's not clear whether this would actually represents the actual the homosexual behavior of a general population. This study also had limitations. More contemporary studies, and this is a hard thing to study because it depends on how you ask the question. Most studies today put the number of gay people in the United States somewhere between one to about four percent. But in the 70s, and Charles Silverstein uh, was part of the activists who dealt with the APA uh, issues that they had actually gave the journalists the 10 percent number as something that you know uh, that they said came from Kinsey studies, but Kinsey studies actually didn't really say that. And the re but the reason that it had a high value is that psych psychiatry was arguing that homosexuality was a rare condition. And so anything that said it wasn't rare moved toward, uh, toward a narrative of the normal variation, a favored cultural narrative of the normal variation. So Kinsey 0 meant the person was exclusively heterosexual. Kinsey 6 meant the person was exclusively homosexual, with five grades of bisexuality in between. This was something I found years ago. The internet. Um, so, you know, Sean, Connery, Sean Connery is James Bond is a Kinsey Zero, and Richard Simmons, the exercise guru, is a Kinsey Six. This was, of course, before Ricky Martin, listed here as a Kinsey Four, came out you know, as gay. And um, I don't know about Justin Timberlake. I think the Kinsey Three is the person who put up the thing. Nobody seems to know who that is. <laughs> The other important person whose work was very valuable in changing uh, ideas was Evelyn Hooker, a psychologist. Uh, there, the APA did produce a documentary about her life. I can't remember the name of it, but it's also worth a uh, view. The other APA. And in 1957, she published a study in an obscure journal called the Journal of Projective Techniques, in which she compared the te psychological test results of 30 non patient homosexuals to 30 non patient heterosexual controls. She used projective tests, which were, used to, which were tests we don't use so much anymore, but at the time were considered you know, in the forefront of determining psychological uh, makeup of people. And she asked three people, who were three leading judges of each of those tests, to look at the test results, but she didn't tell the judges which of the subjects were gay and which were not. So these blind judges found no significant differences in psychopathology between the two groups. This, was, this result was important because it was at odds with the prevailing dominant psychiatric theory of the time, which was that homosexuality was not just a sexual disturbance, but a global disturbance in mental function. That homosexual patients were not just sexually disturbed, they were completely disturbed. Which would be consistent with kind of people who showed up in psychiatrist's office complaining about homosexuality, but not necessarily of the non-patient population. And this also supported, not only did it support a normal variant point of view, it was a reproducible study, and it had been reproduced many times. Then you have influences from cultural studies. We heard a little bit about this morning. Uh, there was a growing criticism of psychiatric diagnoses as socially constructed. Uh, the, the funniest, of course, not so funny completely, but is trapezomania, which was a 19th century mental diagnosis given to slaves in the antebellum South who, quote, have a tendency to run away from their owner due to an inborn propensity for wantonness, uh, as opposed to a wish to escape slavery. Uh, it was a southern doctor who made up the diagnosis. And, you know, and people arguing against the illness model, people with adapt normalizing theories, such as the belief that one is born gay, I think that may, uh, the question I asked earlier, Lance, why, you know, why does he think that gay um, scientists are looking for gay genes? Hamer, Simon Levay, Richard Miller, some notable people. And the answer is that uh, people, some people just need perhaps to be convinced that you know, they were born that way. Uh, arguments against Hill, this model adopt a trans-historical approach that connects modern gay identities to historical figures.
introduce the cultures, so we'll never stop hearing about Walt Whitman. Um, and uh, the idea to demonstrate that anti-homosexual attitudes are culture bound, that they're not uh, adapted necessarily. Prevalent statistics refuting the notion of homosexuality is rare, as I mentioned. The fact that it's difficult to change the sexual orientation through psychotherapy means persuades many people that it's inborn or essential. And let me be very clear here, we don't know what causes homosexuality. Nobody knows the answer to that question. We don't know what causes heterosexuality. Nobody knows the answer to that question. But um, in the absence of knowledge of lots of theories, and to use normative language to replace medical terminology. So we call ourselves gay, we don't call ourselves homosexuals, which is a, a relic of med medicalizing terms. So we've heard a little bit about the 1973 decision. Um, the Stonewall riots, although there was a lot of activism going on before Stonewall, but the Stonewall riots seemed to have, act, activate, energize a lot of gay rights organizations at the time, and it increased mobilization of activists who identified psychiatry as the enemy. And as we heard, in 1970, the activists zapped APA, and by zapping means that they came into a room like this where that psychiatrist was giving a talk, they grabbed the microphone, called him a Nazi doctor, and, you know, and these activities did get the APA's attention. And so in the following years, you may have seen downstairs as well, uh, APA sponsored a symposium, and that's not, and getting a symposium at an APA meeting is not a small thing. There's a scientific program committee. I've been on a few symposium, and I've uh, seen many symposia turned away. So they put on a symposium, and Barbara and Frank were there, and they talked about what it was like to be gay and be pathologized and not be a psychiatric patient. And I think that was very eye-opening for <coughs> people. And as we heard, they wanted the next year to make it to spice it up with uh, a psychiatrist, but again, I'll, I'll expound what Ben said, or what we heard earlier about being a gay psychiatrist. Homosexuality was illegal in 1972, I think in 50, 49 of the states. And only one state that repealed the sodomy law at that time. You could lose your medical license if you were you know, found to be committing a crime. And you certainly wouldn't get promoted Heard, I think, in John's history, I think uh, some issue about his being gay may have played a role in why he was dismissed from the hospital. And, uh, you know, and so it was a big risky thing to do, but he'd already been, as we heard, he'd already been through the risk. So he stepped forward as Dr. Anonymous in the, in the 1972 panel, and as, you know, and here he is with Barbara and Frank, and as I'd like to say, you know, and present it to him, general audience who hasn't heard this one before is that this is what an openly gay psychiatrist looks like in 1970. <laughs> and, and this is what he looked like in, shortly before his death in 2003. Um, so while all the theater is going on in the APA, and you know how much gay people like theater, there's also important work being done in the scientific committees of the, of the APA. And the committees are reviewing uh, the psychoanalytic literature and the sex research literature, and they come to the not surprising conclusion that sex research literature is more scientific than psychoanalytic literature. This is still a problem in my field of psychoanalysis, which mostly depends on case histories in terms of presenting this data. And so after all these, so, and again, I have gotten things passed through APA. It is not an easy thing to move something through APA. It goes to a lot of committees, a lot of people are allowed to put an input in people who don't agree with you. And, but in 1973, after all the committees reviewed it, they accepted the, the findings of the, the Men Butcher Committee, which was the official committee to do it, and the board, our Board of Trustees voted to remove homosexuality from the DSM-2 at the time, and now with the DSM-5. But that was in December of 1973, which coincided with the meeting of the American Psychoanalytic Association at the Waldorf Astoria in New York City, where the analysts were so angry because they had been presenting their case against removal, they had been you know, overruled. They signed a petition with about 200 signatures to, to force a referendum of APA members on whether or not they agreed with the Board of Trustees. Now that bylaw existed to talk about, uh, to deal with administrative matters within the organization, not scientific matters, and the bylaw has been changed. You can't do that anymore the way that was done. But they succeeded in doing the election, uh, enforcing a referendum, 
with the petition, and there were 20,000 APA members at the time, 10,000 voted, and 58% voted to support the board's decision. Now, it's really important to understand that the press and many people wrote these newspaper stories that, you know, a psychiatrist voted to remove from the manual. Actually, most of the psychiatrists at the time had been trained in the illness model. Most of them probably did believe that homosexuality was an illness. So they really weren't voting on that question. The question was raised, do you support the Board of Trustees' decision? Do you support the scientific process within your own organization that came to the conclusion? And that's what won the vote. You know, that people had confidence in the organization rather than in this issue. Now, after the vote, there were many, many people were unhappy. And, uh, there was one textbook for psychiatry that came out in the 80s, I remember when I was uh, reading, and said, you know, they tell the story and said that truth cannot be decided by a vote, or that you can't decide science by a vote. You hear this repeatedly from people uh, like some psychiatrists who never tell you that their side asked for the vote in the first place. <laughs> so that's one issue. But the truth of the matter is that, you know, sometimes science can be decided by a vote. Uh, because in 2006, the International Astronomical Union voted Pluto is no longer a planet. And there's no harder science than astronomy. And the vote as it went was whoever showed up at the convention and whoever showed up at the meeting where they voted. And so after how many years, Pluto, which was classified as a planet, became what's called a dwarf planet. So the point is that, also, uh, that subjectivity is... Uh, is part of the process of science because all facts are filtered through human subjectivities. And subjectivity must be accompanied by some consensually validated reality. This is what Pluto shown by the other planet. <laughs> so this is a history of where homosexuality could be found in the DSM, as we heard in, in DSM-1, it was called a sociopathic personality disturbance. In DSM-2, it was a sexual deviation. In 73, homosexuality was removed from DSM-2 um, and replaced by sexual orientation disturbance. The problem is that I heard that I heard two problems with sexual orientation disturbance. One was sexual, the acronym of sexual orient, uh, orientation disturbance of male youth spells sodomy. So that, so that was not a good thing. And the other problem was that the that diagnosis allowed the possibility that a straight person who wanted to see a psychiatrist because they were unhappy about their sexual orientation and wanted to be gay, because those patients didn't really exist. In 1980, when the DSM-3 came out, it was called, it was changed to ego dystonic homosexuality. Now, ego dystonic homosexuality did not make it into the net to the DSM-3 revision, the DSM-3 R seven years later, for a couple of reasons. One reason uh, most net is that the politics of the organization 16 years later was very different. The anti-gay side had completely backed away and abandoned their activities within APA and focused them within the American Psychoanalytic Association, which continued to treat homosexuality as a problem until 1991-92. The other reason is that the, the diagnosis was clearly more of a political Salomonic compromise between the two sides of the 1970s and really had no empirical basis uh, to continue. And the argument went, well, you know, if a person of color is unhappy about their skin color, should they be given a psychiatric diagnosis? If a person is shorter than they feel they want to be, is that a psychiatric diagnosis? So the essentialist model, the implicit model, was becoming more uh, integrated you know, into the thinking. So it wasn't hard to take it out. I'm. Uh, on a World Health Committee that's revising the ICD-11. ICD-10, which came out in 1990, took out homosexuality and replaced it with ego dystonic sexual orientation. And we published a study, I'm happy to provide anybody a copy, reviewing the utility of the diagnostic category. And the recommendation is that ego dystonic sexual orientation be taken out of the ICD-11, which is scheduled to come out in 2018. Um, in DSM-4, although there was no longer the ego dystonic homosexuality, they gave an example of a, a, there was a, every DSM diagnosis has a wastebasket category called the NOS or not otherwise specified. If you have a diagnosis that doesn't exactly fit into all the criteria, then you give it an NOS diagnosis. 
And, but this is one where they gave examples where persistently marked distress about sexual orientation continued from 1994 through 2013 for 20 years in the DSM-4, but in DSM-5 it was taken out. There's no mention of that anymore. And no justification within, within the current DSM-5, which I also worked on, to justify a conversion therapy. And this is homosexuality, the ICD. The ICD-6 was the first one that had um, diagnoses of uh, mental disorders. So it was called pathological personality, and subcategory sexual deviance, then same thing in, in ICD-7, then just the sexual deviance in ICD-8, sexual deviance and disorders in 1975, and then it took place in 1990 with a group of uh, non-existent diagnoses that people made up. There's no record of how that happened, how these decisions were made. But in ICD-11, these diagnoses will all be gone. Meanwhile, APAs, we heard, not only did they issue a strong anti-discrimination statement after the uh, events of 1973, I think pioneering statement, uh, deploring discrimination in housing, in the workplace, or putting an extra burden on gay people, who we were still being referred to as homosexuals at the time, but uh, but in 1990, the APA issued a uh, position statement opposing the discrimination in the armed forces. In 1998-2000, opposed sexual conversion therapies. In 2000, uh, after Vermont uh, allowed same-sex civil unions, so we passed a position statement supporting them. In 2002, after the American Academy of Pediatrics issued a position supporting second parent adoptions by same-sex couples, APA did as well. APA signed on to Lawrence uh, and Garner v. Texas that opened joint sodomy laws in 2003. And in 2005, uh, I was involved in the APA position statement supporting marriage equality. I would have to say that it was not my gay committee's idea. I was chair of the Committee on Gay, Lesbian, and Bisexual Issues at the time. It was the leadership of APA who came to our because I had no personal desire at the time to get married. It changed my mind since, but, uh, but the um, and I had a personal desire to push the process through APA, but the leadership of APA, the heterosexual leadership of APA, came to our committee and said, we want to, we, before we sign on to a, a legal brief for marriage equality in the state, we need a, a resource document to do that. So our committee produced a resource document on the mental health benefits of uh, marriage. And then after we produced that, they said, now we want you to write a position statement, which we did, and it passed. 2005, and uh, I would say that came from the top, not from us. So the aftermath of APA's decision. APA's 1973 diagnostic revision ended organized medicine's formal participation in the social stigmatization of uh, homosexuality, and as a result, debate shifted back into the moral and political realms because we deprived religious, government, military, media, and education institutes of any medical or scientific rationalization for discrimination. Not a small thing. The Immigration and Naturalization Service of the United States continued to list homosexuality as, a, as, a, as an illness for which you could not uh, emigrate to the United States until 1989. And when somebody brought it up to them in 1989, they got rid of that. So the cult, what followed after the APA's decision was the, what I call cultural normalization of homosexuality. If it's not an illness, and if one doesn't literally accept biblical prohibitions against it, and if our contemporary secular democracy separates church and state, and if openly gay people are able to prepare to function as productive citizens, then what's wrong with being gay? Well, the tribe will tell you, but the rest of us have other ideas. And there's nothing wrong with being gay, then what moral and legal principles should a larger society endorse in helping gay people openly live their lives? Now, it's important to remember, in 73, the, homes, the uh, APA did not declare that homosexuality was normal. They simply said it wasn't a disorder. They weren't ready to, to take that. But of course, if it's not a disorder, then what is it? So some of the issues that come up, legal issues like repeal of sodomy laws follow, workplace issues like gays in the military, gays as teachers, <clears throat> gays as physicians and mental health professionals, family issues like civil unions, marriage, adoption, hospital visitation, and inheritance rights, 
and the religious community, because of course we're seeing with larger social conversation about homosexuality, more and more religious denominations are becoming more tolerant, and polls show that even among evangelical Christians, the younger generation is not as anti-gay as their elders. So, you know, this is all father. I have an LGBT mental health listserv, if you would like to be on it, send me an email, and um, tell me who you are, so I can know who you are. I'm the only one who posts to it, so it's not for me to chatter. And thank you.